to, to get insight into this. We, as an astrophysicist, we've seen throughout time the hubris that comes with any discovery that gets made. Or the hubris that prevents the acceptance of a discovery that might demote your sense of self from whatever you previously imagined it to be. Among them is, where is Earth? Is it the center of all things? No, it's not even a significant planet in orbit around an ordinary star in the corner of an ordinary galaxy, one of 100 billion galaxies in the universe. And so here we are saying, let's search for life in the universe, intelligent life like us. Well, who are we to say that we're intelligent? I mean, I pose that not as a joke question, but as a very serious question. We define ourselves to be intelligent in ways that no other creature can rival. Okay, now what do we credit that intelligence to? So you look at the genome, and let's take the chimp, I guess that's a really close relative of ours, and we have, what is it, 90, high 90s percent identical, indistinguishable DNA. And the chimp does not build the Hubble telescope, and the chimp does not compose symphonies. So we must then declare that everything we say about us that is intelligent is found in that one and a half percent difference in DNA. Is that first, is that a fair statement yeah. to make? Okay. Let me invert that question. If the genetic difference between humans and chimps is that small, maybe the difference in our intelligence is also that small. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the difference between stacking boxes and reaching a banana, putting up an umbrella when it rains, whatever are these rudimentary things a chimp does that the primatologists roll them forward and boast about, which of course our toddlers can do, maybe the difference between that and the Hubble telescope is as small as that difference in DNA. Because I pose the question, suppose there was another life form on Earth or elsewhere, that in that same sort of vector, that one and a half percent difference we are to chimps, suppose they were one and a half percent different from us. They would then roll the smartest of us in front of their hum humatologists <laughs> and say, the Hawking, there's Hawking, oh, this one is slightly smarter than the rest of them because he can do astrophysics calculations in his head. <laughs> like little Timmy over here. Yeah. So I wonder if we're just blithering idiots in the presence of even a trivially smarter species than us. So therefore, who are we to even assert that, number one, we are intelligent and we're looking for others at least as intelligent as us out there to talk yeah. to? By but the way, is there any other species on Earth that we can talk to? Can, can we have a conversation with a chimp that has nearly identical DNA and I don't think we can actually Say, hey, what movie do you want to see tonight? But you don't have that conversation with a chimp. Yet somehow we believe, we want to believe, that an alien on another planet that's not even based on DNA, and even if it is, it's not nothing like us, that we could communicate with it. Yeah. I'm screaming at you. I'm sorry. I'm well. Just... <laughs> I mean, so what do you, so, so there. Well, I'm all for, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all for. Are we for, as stupid as I'm saying? I'm all for deflating hubris. But, um, I mean, it, it's, it's also true, of course, that our brains are anatomically very, very much bigger than chimps. And so that also is contained, must be contained in some sense, in that tiny little percentage of DNA. I think the way to look at the DNA problem is to say that um, it, the, the, the sort of DNA that has been sequenced and the sort of thing that's, that on which we base that calculation of the 98% is, if you look at um, the... Uh, Again, look at, look at a computer and you'll find that most of the programs that are, that are written are, um, at the machine code level, are calling up the same set of subroutines. There's a subroutine for pulling down menu bars and a subroutine for moving windows and, and, and so on. That's what we're looking at in this 98%. What we're not looking at is the set of sort of high-level instructions that say, call this subroutine now, now call this one, now call this one, now call that one. It's not just humans and chimpanzees. All mammals have pretty much the same repertoire of uh, genetic subroutines. And it's the difference between a, a man and a mouse, is all, like the difference between a man and a chimpanzee, is the order in which they're called, the sequence in which they're called, 
during embryology, which causes the really quite substantial anatomical differences between a human and a mouse, um, and the quite big differences in, in, in brain size. If we assume we are not some measure of things, then, as I said earlier, that tells me that the day might come where we could go in, understand which sequences are called in what way, and invent whole new sequences never before dreamt of by biology. Yep, absolutely. Empowering us in ways yes. never before It's Very, known very of. difficult. It's much more difficult than it sounds, but still it's in, it's in principle possible. Um, but the other point about intelligent life in the universe, um, never mind how we define intelligence, they're only, we're only going to encounter them if they are intelligent enough either to come here, which is very difficult indeed, or to send radio transmissions to us, which is a lot easier, but still requires, let's just define it as, as the quality that you need in order to send information across the universe. Now, you don't have to call that intelligence, but whatever it is, that's what it needs in order to get here, in order for us to, to apprehend it. And I wonder, you know, surely you've walked past a worm that had just crawled out of the earth, and when you did so, you weren't saying to yourself, gee, I wonder what that worm is thinking. You, didn't, you just simply didn't care. You're so far beyond the, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm imagining you simply really don't care what the worm is thinking, and the worm, conversely, has no clue that you consider yourself intelligent. You're just this thing that went by. So can you imagine a species that has such high intelligence that the prospect of communicating with us is simply of no interest to them? Yeah, I can, yeah. And they go by and we, their intelligence is on such a level that we can't even recognize it yes. as intelligence. Yes, and moreover, I think it would more or less have to be that much ahead of us if we were ever to meet them, because we're never going to get there. Yeah, we're so, um, we sure as hell not getting there. And, but so, <laughs> great. So see any, the NASA budget lately? It would, yeah. It's not. <laughs> so anything that gets here has got to have a very, very highly developed technology, far and, more than we've... Than we've uh, that brings done. us to Stephen Hawking's concern about any civilization sufficiently advanced to visit us. What does that say about the consequence of that encounter? Yeah. And he's worried, of course, because he's taking his cue from the history of humans, with one has a more advanced technology than the other, and they visit. Uh, it almost is always bad for those with the lesser technology. And South America, one of the sort of more obvious examples in their first encounter with the Spaniards. So um, this, or, I'm, I don't know if I want to be the first one to shake hands or shake Whatever whatever, they, whatever, they're, whatever, shake, yes. whatever they're sticking forward, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I so I have, I'm, a, I, I want to do it, but I, I still have my, my concerns. What do you think are the odds that uh, there is life elsewhere in the universe? Uh, they must be high, and, and mm. I'll tell you why. People say, "Well, have you found life yet?" Well, no. Well, there, you know. That's like going to the ocean. This has been said before. Taking a cup of water, scooping up, and say. There are no whales in the ocean, you know? <laughs> Here's my data, you know? <laughs> you, you need a slightly bigger sample. And so if you look at, for example, what we call the radio bubble, this is the sphere around Earth, centered on Earth, which is the farthest our radio signals have reached in the galaxy. And they're about 70 light years away. We've been transmitting radio signals inadvertently leaking into space for about 70 years. 70 light year radius sphere. Well, how big is the galaxy? Well, shrink that sphere down to maybe the size of a BB, and then the galaxy on that scale would be the size of this stage. That's how far our radio signals have traveled. And those aren't even the ones we sent on purpose. The ones we sent on purpose have traveled much less. So no, we haven't actually um, reached as far into the galaxy as we'd like before we would say definitively that there's no one intelligent living today. But here's some very simple facts. I can review them in 90 seconds. You look at the formation of the Earth and the earliest sign of fossil life. Subtract a few hundred million years at the beginning of Earth when Earth was a shooting gallery. Earth was still accreting the, the, the birth materials of the solar system. It's hostile to complex chemistry over that time. Not fair to start the clock then. Wait a couple hundred million years, now start the clock, and wait around and see when you have the first signs of single-celled life. 
at most 400 million years. At most. Earth has been around for four and a half billion. So Earth, without any help from us, with basic ingredients found throughout the universe, managed to create life, simple though it was. So, and Earth, one of, you know, eight planets, get over it, uh, <laughs> what, uh, one of, sorry, <laughs> Earth, one, uh, an ordinary star, uh, to suggest, and, and what, what are the ingredients of life? The number one atom in your body is hydrogen. Number two atom is oxygen, together making mostly water that's in you. Next is carbon in this order. Next is nitrogen. Next is other stuff. My favorite element, other, yeah. <laughs> you look in the universe, the number one element in the universe is hydrogen. Next is helium, chemically inert, couldn't do anything with it anyway. Next is carbon. I think I left that oxygen there. Next is oxygen. Next is nitrogen. One for one. We're not even made of odd things. The most common things in the universe are found here on Earth, and we're made of them. And carbon, one of the most chemically fertile, the most chemically fertile element on the periodic table, it's not a surprise, we're carbon-based. Life is just the extreme expression of complex chemistry. So that's what life, that's what biology is. So all these people who want to imagine imagine, because they remembered the chemistry class, that, that silicon sits right below carbon on the periodic table, so it bonds similarly to carbon, so they want to imagine silicon-based life. I'm saying, okay, fine, but you don't have to. There's five times as much carbon in the universe as silicon. There's no need to even have to go there. We got enough to imagine just simply with the carbon atom at the center of these, of these huge biological molecules. Point is, it happened relatively quickly with the most common ingredients in the universe. To now say life on Earth is unique in the universe would be inexcusably egocentric. Yeah, I agree with that. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs>